Friday. Um, we are in Dallas right now. <clears throat> uh, went had a conference and uh, had a meeting with NPLA again, which was interesting. Uh, the tone is changing a little bit. When before it was like heavily optimistic, all good news. And then the inflation numbers came out recently, right? I don't know if anybody saw that, but uh, it's definitely its highest since 2008. <clears throat> so it was a big discussion about, you know, how is, uh, how is every, what is everyone seeing in their local areas and stuff? So what, what we see is definitely um, increase in prices, in gas, in um, rental cars. And so I'm not sure if you guys are noticing anything uh, changing, but it's something to keep eyes on, I guess. Um, I know that um, one of uh, one of the smart guys in the room, John Hornick, who's our actual attorney, um, he was he was kind of taking the opposite side, where he's saying, you know, he it's it's he feels it's more of a supply and demand issue, right? Like the rental cars, they had the crisis, they had to, I think, liquidate a lot of their inventory. Um, so now that the the space has come back full force, now they're a little light right on the cars. So um, it's a supply and demand issue. And then not only that, but the car manufacturers were having supply chain issues during COVID. So um, uh, like all the dealerships are short on inventory and stuff. So that could be the main cause. I don't know if it's inflation, but I, I kind of agree with John where uh, I, th I think it's too early now to like start to push the panic button. Um, but something to keep eyes on for sure. Does anybody have anything to say about that? Anybody following it more than I am? I'm not following it, but we had to replace the stove in one of our units and the exact same model was over $200 more than we paid just like a year ago for another unit where we had to buy a stove, same store, same everything. And they didn't even have any in stock uh, for another week. No stoves in stock at the Home Depot. So we had to go with Lowe's and then get an even more expensive model because, you know, tenants need a stove, can't wait a week. So it's my own personal experiences. It's ridiculous. Not just lumber prices that are up, stove prices. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's oh definitely God, something we got to keep eyes on because it affects uh, us, right? The, the material costs are definitely going up. There were supply chain issues there too, so now we're short in the in the inventory for lumber. Um, what else? Where else is feeling some pressure? Uh, I know Delta. Delta to get on the phone with Delta. Okay, cool, I can talk about this, but it's it's taking forever. And uh, what did they tell you, Kikwa? Was the problem? Oh, they had, uh, they had reduced the staffing, like even at Delta, just during COVID. And then now with the vaccines coming out, everybody's starting to travel again. So airports are full, airplanes are full, but they haven't increased staffing for any of the airport staff as well as the hotel and travel type uh, call centers. And so as a result, wait times at Delta are running two hours plus to just get an operator on the phone. So uh, it's interesting times for sure. Has anybody noticed any uh, in major increases overall on your rehabs for any fix and flips and, and where have you noticed uh, are some ways to try to save money to balance the budget we, we haven't noticed any i mean I, I i've heard um of issues <clears throat> but i mean we haven't really gone into anything new so we haven't had recent bids to compare, but I'd like to dive in a little deeper on that Delta thing because what, what do you guys think will happen? Because, okay, so they kind of let go or furloughed a lot of em employees through COVID and now they're getting an influx of, you know, customer support <clears throat> calls. And uh, now that travel is kind of a little bit more acceptable they're getting bombarded with bookings and questions and all that. So are they going to have to scramble to get their former employees back? 
and entice them a little more. I mean, I heard McDonald's is offering people $50 just to take an interview. Did you hear that? So now the, not only because the people who are in unemployment, some of them were just getting so much that it does, like, why would the, it, it takes away the incentive to go to work, you know? So now that these companies, they need their employees back, preferably the ones that know how to do the job to decrease the lead time in mobilizing again, um, are they going to have to start paying more? And then does that cost get pushed down to customers? Um, or is, is this thing? What happened was when, when, um, when COVID struck, nobody knew what was going to happen and nobody knew how long it was going to happen. And so all of the companies from hotel to um, rental cars, everybody got, um, they got notice. So they got paid out everything. So the, all of the all of the um, the long term employees, the ones that have been working for 25, 30 years, that can do multiple jobs. They can work housekeeping and then go upstairs and work in the administration or whatever. They don't want to come back. They feel they feel that they were um, fired. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure there's some some feelings like that that will also give the employees or former employees um, leverage, right? Uh, they know they're worth now. Now they're worth a lot before they're expendable. So like, how do you go back? <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't know how that'll affect the economy as a whole, but it seems to be a problem right now because a lot of companies are short staffed um, because the it seems like the uh, like Main Street like wants to come back, like the people, the economy wants to come back to normal so much that there's an influx of travel inquiries and hotel airlines. So, and rental cars. So like how, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to manage it and if that's going to affect anything, but something small can start a large ripple effect across the economy. Right. So for the housing market, I'm trying to think, you know, and we all should be trying to think ahead of time um, to stay a step ahead that well, how is this going to affect our industry, if any, you know, if it will. So I know the short term vacation rental space is coming back kind of strong. Um, is anybody here? Is anybody here in that space where they're targeting short term vacation rentals? Let's see. Not in the space, but uh, I got another comment about coming back. Uh, I was in HR for a very long time. We worked with a lot of medical leave, short-term disability, and we're going to start seeing um, a lot of that coming into the, the main stage of employment going forward now that employers are asking employees to come back to the offices because not only do you have uh, medical leave, those who can't necessarily afford to go back into the office due to their medical condition, you also have uh, religious freedom, those who don't necessarily want a vaccine or it's against their religion. So we're going to, in the next few months, see a lot of companies um, combating that and really looking at what can we do to help run the business versus help um, support the employee. And you're going to see different states also um, tackle that differently, um, such as like California, if you go on short-term disability, you get paid out 60, 65%, and then the rest gets paid by the state. So you're getting hundred percent. There's really no incentive to come back, but other states don't necessarily have that, that state protection. So I think a lot of the other states that don't have that extra short-term disability, um, you're gonna see a lot more pushback from the employers on coming back and more willingness from the employees to come back because they're not making that full percentage. So those are definitely gonna come down the pipeline and. Uh, from an HR standpoint, we're going to see lawsuits galore <laughs> eventually going with COVID, just with uh, employers trying to force employees to come back. We, we just have never seen this before. There's no laws out there. I got a lot of lawyer buddies that are like, we, we don't know what to do with this. But at the same time, they don't want to be the case study in the lawsuit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought of that. Um. Okay, why don't we get into uh, our leads, needs and good deeds. Anybody got anything they need? Let me see if uh, 
Jeremy's on the line too. That's um, if someone might be interested. I'm doing we've got some like um, real short term hotels in Indianapolis. If some guys want to do or like trying to look for like basically like 50 50 equity partnership splits, and so you'll get higher than the normal um, whatever like the 10 to 12 percent, but it's gonna be like a short term hold, you know. So basically, like we're just locking these up like a little bit under the retail where there's enough for like of a spread for like a make. 20 grand on it and split it in half or whatever on like 20, 25, 20, 30 grand on these like short slips in Indianapolis. If somebody might be interested in something like that, so. Nice. Oh, Carolyn raised her hand. Daniel, are you fixing and flipping these or whole tailing them? So they're, they're basically ones that like the, we think we can for like as is, with, I mean, basically with like a thousand dollars worth of work, just like fix doorknobs or whatever. So, but then we're getting them at a, at a big enough discount where it's just, we just want to get in and out quickly in the, in the indie market. So we're doing some like direct, we're doing some direct to seller marketing in the, and so the, but we just, so we don't want to do like, there are no big rehabs. It's just like, Hey, like uh, buy it for like whatever, like a little bit, put in some stuff. And we're working with like a local, like um, realtor who's kind of like going to be like, who's invested in it as far as being, he's going to get a sale and he's going to manage like the, the process of just getting the contract in there to, whatever do the sewer scopes and whatever to make sure there's like a it's like he like so he knows he can sell in the back end quickly you know and so basically that's yeah. it. that makes sense i'm actually going through a similar experience right now in india i picked up a an off-market deal that was supposed to be my first indie flip um but looking at the numbers my my rehab budget kept on creeping up mm -hmm. and uh and so i decided to just test the market as is um and put it on the market and uh, actually got uh, quite a few offers. So um, just going in escrow today um, and yeah, without putting any, any work into it, um, this one's gonna be a profit of about 20, 27, 28K. So um, yeah, the market's really hot <laughs> even if you don't do any work to, these, to some of these properties. So yeah, if you have some good deals, hit me up. I might be, uh, I might be interested. Okay. That's awesome, yeah. Well. Um, I got some, uh, Jeremy Mateo, who was on a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. Um, <clears throat> he's actually got a, a deal that's, he's going to kind of hotel as well. And I would say like, if you're going to hotel properties, like this market, it, you're not going to see a better time to do it, you know, right now. Um, but just be careful. Cause I've seen guys get stuck trying to wholesale properties. So, or hotel properties. So just make sure to have it an alternative exit strategy that at the worst case scenario you can execute on and, um, and break even at the very least, you know, but because hoteling relies a lot on uh, appreciation, you know, and you're basically, you're, you're somewhat speculating. You're buying at a right price that you know that you can put on the market, but then again, it's got to, you're not really focusing too much on the value add. Right. So, um, Hey, uh, I saw Matt in the chat. You got a good deed to talk about, huh? We could we could hear a nice good deed story. <laughs> just a general story um, on saving money with just construction costs in general. I have a con contractor buddy who was working on a, a decking for a client, and it was using one of those like Trex materials, so not actual lumber, but those have raised prices even more than lumber because it's it's the alternative. So he was trying to save money for his. Um, his person that he was doing the deck with. And he actually got an idea to call the manufacturer of the, the Trex uh, material. It, was, it wasn't Trex, but another company. And they turned out to have um, a decking material that is going out of stock or, or out of their line. Essentially, they are changing the design on the material because it's all made out of recycled plastic. And you can't even tell the difference between the two. He showed me side by side. They look exactly the same, but because they're discontinuing it, he got the, the entire materials half off, which raised his profits on that deal. It was, a, it was a great win story for him. Nice. Yeah. Just that extra step, not, not necessarily working with the local hardware, but going straight to the source. Nice. I like it. I like that. Thanks, Matt. Um, I just want to do a quick uh, intro. We got our friend uh, Lance on the line, Lance Wakefield. What's up, brother? What's up, man? Yeah, so he, Lance is here in Dallas, but he, um, 
home is also uh, Hawaii for him. He he grew up in uh, North Shore side, so um, it, you know, first time going to Dallas, uh, I texted Brandon Turner, just like who's the you know, it's the same model that I have for every market we go into. You got to text Brandon, you know, that guy's got you know huge reach. So and I said, hey, who's the players out in Dallas? <laughs> you know, and he's like. Oh, I don't know. I just, uh, I just know Lance, you know, and he's the guy to call. So I called, I was like, I know Lance. Okay. So I called, called Lance. We had some barbecue and uh, man, he's, he's, he's doing a lot of fun, interesting stuff that we, um, he's willing to share too. So hopefully, I don't know, some week, maybe next week or, or whenever you're free, Lance, so jump on and we can talk about your story. And um, Lance was also on Bigger Pockets podcast uh, episode. What was that episode, Lance? Uh, 236. Okay, 236. So if you want to hear Lance's story, um, you know, he's uh, episode 236 on Bigger Pockets. So, yeah. And hopefully we'll be doing a lot of business with him out here in Dallas. Thanks, right, bro. Are you at the office? The intro. <laughs> yeah, I'm at the office right now. I just I just said bye to Kekoa. He was here a minute ago and he just left and now I'm pretending like I'm working for the next hour or so. <laughs> yeah. Nice, dude. Well, thank you. And also, thank you for, you know, putting your trust in us with your loans, too. I think we got yeah, some man. good news if you haven't heard already. But uh, um, what's the good news? Well, we can go up to 75 now of the land. Oh, yeah. Even of, better. Uh, yeah. So, and you guys got, they got deals all over the place. So, we support Ground Up, uh, our Ground Up product. So, it's going to be awesome. We're going to. That's awesome. I'm excited. Yeah, bro. Well, thanks again for meeting with us and you and Kiko this this morning. <laughs> he just yeah, leaves. No, it's great. Like, uh, I, I wake up too late. That's why. So he just digs out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what he said. But we, I took, I took him and got some real Tex Mex. So he'll have to take you there sometime. It was Ooh. pretty good. Okay. Well, I'm sure we'll be back. Yeah. Yeah, he's gonna try and buy every apartment complex in Dallas. So I think you guys will end up back here. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, cool. Are you back yet? You ready to rock and roll? I'm sitting here in the parking garage because Lance and I took too long at Tex-Mex. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. We'll go there for dinner. Maybe we can break in on Lance's uh, date night. Bro, you should, uh, Lance's story is incredible. The tornado ran through his house and destroyed his home. He just rebuilt his house with his own hands last year. So it was kind of fun. It's a great wow. story. Holy crap. That doesn't sound fun at all. Dude, bro, it was you... COVID. What else was there to do, bro? Oh, and COVID? The house. Ouch. Well, everything shut down and my house was destroyed. I was like, I guess I'll just build it. What else am I going to do? So. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I'm, glad you guys, safe, but... I'm glad you and the family were safe. That's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, today, well, we're just open discussion again. Let's talk about what everyone's got going on. So feel free to un unmute and just say what's up. And if you guys are working on anything that you need help on, then uh, let's talk about it. Hey, Lance, you want to share that uh, deal that you just got in uh, Irvine and see if maybe somebody has a, a possible lead or interest in that? Yeah, sure. Um, I got, uh, I contracted a couple of days ago, an eight unit um, office building. It's like a doctor suite type of thing um, in Irving, which is like right next to the airport in Dallas, Fort Worth. And um um, we contracted it for 725 I think um, I think at a six cap if we take the more rent to all the tenants are like month to month the landlord is 91 or 93 or something he's old his all all his leases are oral there's no nothing in writing and everyone pays every month because they're so far under rent that where else are they going to go so um obviously the plan is buy it put leases in place um, put rent to market rent and then at market rent um, I think I think at a six cap it's uh, worth like 1.1 million uh, but I don't have the 150 to, to close on it and I've never I'm not like super experienced with uh, commercial like office buildings like I don't know what I don't know uh, but the building's in good shape like it doesn't need any improvements it's just 
like leases right. and stuff. Right. And so uh, yeah, I'm wholesaling it. I, have, I put it out the wholesale uh, locally. I haven't blasted out to my list yet, but put it out for like 800. I have an appraisal on it for 877 as is, and I don't really know what to do with it. So if anyone wants to partner on it or something, I'm open. I don't know what to do with it. So nice. Make a deal. Okay. Well, 150 grand is what you need. Oh uh, yeah, it's like the down payment. Like okay. if I go to a bank, you know, seven twenty-five, they want they want twenty percent. So, right. I yeah. think. Is what I'm How is the I'm office to to space? How is the office space here in Dallas? Because downtown seems kind of dead. Yeah, downtown is dead because that's where all like the big players are at, like the big four accounting firms and that sort of thing. And they all have to be like, you know, super careful with COVID, like you're talking about earlier. But mm -hmm. now, um, like the small office space, it's like. You know, individuals and this is medical like you know if you need if you have like physical therapy going on it's not like oh well covid so i don't need physical therapy anymore you still need physical therapy um so people are still going to that sort of thing right so the smaller office spaces seem to be doing pretty well um but the big office spaces seem to be hurting more so uh, yeah that makes sense that makes a lot of sense actually so all right guys well well is anybody else in the Dallas area or market? Oh, Lance, Matt is saying to send, if you can send the details, you can send it to some inf investor friends if. Yeah, for sure. Bye bye. Yeah, let me, uh, let me find the appraisal yeah. and then um, I can I can put like a link for that into the, the chat here like, so that everyone can again, man, look your appraisal if they want to. That's most of like, the information I've got like on it. Go over one okay, cool. Cash. Perfect, thank you. I think I have one one friend in Dallas. Um, would you be willing to work with out-of-state investors? Yeah, yeah, I don't care. I, I, I know the local banks that can fund it and stuff. I just, uh, it's not really like what I do. What I do is single family. And so it's kind of out of my space, but I know enough, enough about it that I can get by. I just, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It. So it's a deal, but it's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the best. <laughs> and you know, for Lance, like they drop a lot of money for off market marketing. So like, if anybody's like a little scared to give the first dollar for marketing, like, you know, I think it's, I think when we bring Lance on to talk about what he does and kind of dive into, you know, his business a little bit, um, it'll show that, yeah, if you're going to do marketing, you got to commit to marketing. You got to commit to be, to, to shoveling money out, you know, and uh, <clears throat> once you build the momentum and you get better, you build a team, you know, that's great. Cause he's got a, a team, you know, that and everybody has their roles and, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. So, uh, I can't wait to, to bring him back on and uh, share his share what he's got going on. So I think it would be inspiring Thanks, for all of us. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Cause it's not easy to cut like, uh, you know, maybe like a $50,000 check or like <laughs> every month or something like to, for marketing. Right. But when you start to see the, the returns on that, then you're then it gets a little easier but initially i bet it's very it was, it's very scary right just like for everyone just getting started so um. well the first check i cut was like 20 grand for marketing and i gave it to someone i like went and visited their office in atlanta and like i was seriously worried because that all the tables they had were like all their desks were like the costco fold-out tables oh no and i was like bro they're gonna like they're gonna <laughs> shut down over the weekend take my 20k i'll never find them again but it all worked out but they, oh, good, good. Yeah, it all worked out. It all worked out, thankfully. Now, now I keep writing those checks because it keeps keeps making money, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. All right. Anybody else got anything going on? Let's see. Ben. Oh, yeah. Um, We might have a couple off markets in Hawaii coming up. Uh where um we're working with a hard money lender here who's in first position and it was for an investor who went belly up in hawaii and there's a couple there's a, a property out in kanioe i think um the lender is old 650 but it's right it's close to the water 
Um, ARV might be around 1.2 ish. Now it might be like 1.3 or something. I don't know, but um, it, it needs some work. It's still got to be built out uh, and finished, but it might be a nice project for somebody looking in Hawaii. There's also one in Wilhelmina. <clears throat> so uh, that one has a lot of, I think it has a lot of upside. So the lender is possibly thinking about um, finishing out, finishing it out on his own, um, but probably utilizing our crew to do it. But if he doesn't, then that's another possible deal. It's two houses on the property. And um, if you can CPR it and renovate it and sell, then you could make you know good money on that project. So just as a heads up for now, we're going to be diving into it more. So if anyone's like starving for deals, you know, like we might have a few coming out in Hawaii. And I know it's really hard right now to get into deals. So um, just giving a heads up that we'll have something soon. Okay. Uh, let's see. Chris. Chris Watchendorf. <laughs> I see you. Do you have any movement on your project out in uh, Hawaii? What's the latest? Uh, yeah, the, the latest is uh, we got the deep borings finally. And they went down to 38 feet before they hit rock, which is not good. Ooh. And uh, the soil samples uh, that they were pulling out were crumbly and, you know, kind of what we expected. But we were hoping uh, we were hoping about 16 feet, but a 38 foot retaining wall is going to be costly. Dang. I'm going to. We're going to hold out until uh, the civil engineer gets involved. He's he's looking at the data now and we'll see. But okay. yeah, no movement, just you, you sit here and you wait for everyone to do their little part. Yep. Yep. Well, that'll be a, yeah, that would be a big retaining wall. You basically have to blow up the mountain, right? Well, I, I can get down there. It's just, uh, um, uh, side note, I just bought a backhoe. <laughs> oh, yeah, great, yeah. So we we can get down there. It's just how to, the, the cost of the concrete uh, to keep the hill from moving now. Right, so. yep, yep. Are we still bringing Tyler? We're going to, yeah. Okay, help is on the way. <laughs> yeah, are we, we going to do a mastermind? We're all yeah. open now, I hear. No what? mask. Yeah, I know, right? Is it only if you've been vaccinated, though? Okay. Yeah, my boss just called me. He said, oh, it looks like we're coming back to work next week. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, yeah, so nothing, nothing else happened over here. Sorry, I don't know how I got muted, but um, Governor Iges, I thought, said that they will continue to monitor the CD or the CDC's guidelines or whatever, but they're not going to lift the mask mandate. Is that correct? In Hawaii? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Call is back in the house. <laughs> He's muted. Oh yeah. You're muted, dude. Hello. Sorry. I had to get in the elevator. Back home. Um, so we're gonna bring for uh you for you chris uh tyler um fager yeah from vegas so he does all the horizontal development for these big for the big boys um and then they come in and buy and they do the the, uh, the no, vertical yeah the vertical yeah so um thanks to alex you know he's uh I think we'll get him down there to help out. I don't know how much he can help though. I mean, if the soil, the soil is the soil, right? So. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll, we'll mastermind on that, but yeah, we'll, we'll try to put something together. Help you out, Chris. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's see. Anybody facing any challenges with uh, any of the projects that they got going on now that they'd want to try to problem solve or? Troubleshoot together. 
the guys that had stuff to talk about aren't on today. So I know Jeremy's got <clears throat> a deal that he's probably looking for some gap financing, which we're looking into to see if we can help them with that. Um, and then uh, I know Keone just closed or he's closing on something, um, which is in the short term vacation rental space. So I wanted to ask him on that if he was on, but looks like he's not on today. So. Hey, hey Corey. Yeah. Hey, Jerry. Hey, how's it? Uh, I'm working, so don't tell Evie. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I, I just had a question if anybody had any um, experience getting HELOCs on out of state uh, investment properties. Ooh. Anybody have any experience getting HELOCs on out of state investment properties? Where, what state? Memphis. Memphis. Huh. Do you know any of the local banks out there? Um, I was able to get in touch with one, but they don't do the HELOCs. I've tried PenFed and Ridge Lending Group out in Oregon. PenFed won't do if you have more than three. Uh, Ridge Lending Group has this all in one HELOC thing. It's not really a true HELOC. Is there a realtor that you work with over there? Because I, I've my my stuff out there is a turnkey stuff. Um, I, I have a real well. There's a realtor associated with that management group. Does she have I, lenders that she works with? Then you can try to ask them. Which yeah, I, I gotta find another one because she's not real cooperative. She doesn't really like to do stuff with out of state investors other than just sell uh, and and have us go through the property management group. So yeah, what do you what do you what exactly are you looking for, Jerry? Just like a, a regular lender or something like like a specific? Well, I guess what it is is um I got properties out there uh, without a mortgage, so trying to pull out some equity, either HELOC or cash out refi, just to um do something else with it. <laughs> I've got a guy who's like pretty creative, and like he's pretty big in the investor scene, like a lender, and so. He actually like he has he's pretty big in bigger pockets too, but I'll send you his contact. He might be somebody you might want to just like pick his brain and see what he has, like some options he might have for you. Oh, that'll be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we also own some property in Tennessee. And if you want to put your email in the chat, I can send you the contact person who I work with out there. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And I know uh Gene and Sherry who were on last week. We're, we're, we're just talking about um, their investment property in uh, Tennessee. I think the doll is invested over there as well. So perhaps they know banks um, that would help them along. They can help you along. Yeah. I have a question on, on a different topic. I'm running into, is anyone else having issues with their CPA or accounting? Because my CPA is like I've been on top of my taxes in advance and I've given everything that they need. I follow up every day like several times a day. She's always been a rock star. And then I know that she's struggling with staff staying just because of all the shifts through the elections and the tax changes um, with COVID and everything that it's just becoming a mess. So I got three other referrals and they're all backed up. I tried getting the guy on Coffee Talk the other day, been bugging for it reach out to Keiko and he's all booked up. And I just don't know if, I, if, does anyone else have these issues or if not, do they have someone who's savvy and creative who is going to file? My, my tax person got back to me yesterday and she's like, I'm so sorry, Ash, I'm just not gonna get it done by the deadline. I put you on for the 20th. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. When is your deadline, Ash? When is your tax due? Tax deadline federal is the 17th. Um, and she put me on the books for the 20th. You can file the extension for October, yeah? I mean, uh, to give yourself- Yeah, she's gonna file the extension. I mean, outside of some personal liability, you, that doesn't extend your payments. And every year, if I wanna avoid penalty, and every year she does, like last two years, she's done this. And so I overpay on my taxes, like exponentially. And then, you know, <clears throat> might not get the- so good. Back for other reasons. <laughs> Um, I just, that bugger, 2017, I just haven't filed it still. Uh, I just keep forgetting. So they keep retaining my, uh, reimbursements and, you know, we bought, we're buying this house in Kailua. I can't do that this year. 
I can't overpay. Um, so I just want to, I know I can extend, but I'm going to switch accountants long for sure. I want to know if everyone else is having this problem, if I need to be a little bit more patient, which I already feel like I am. Are Danny, I'm assuming you, you're on a tight ship. Are you having problems or do you file your own taxes? Well, my, mine's not due to October, so I'm not going to like, so I have it like ready to go, but I'm not going to probably like have a consult until probably a couple months before that. So, but I mean, I can give you my contact, like get that, that I use. I'm not sure maybe if you, I'm not sure if you tried them already, but uh, my guy, I'll, I'll send it to you over um, email. Yeah, that would be good. Is he savvy? Like, does he come up with creative ideas or do you have to keep yeah. him he's a, he's a, he's like a, he's a pretty savvy real estate um, accountant. So. Cool. Is that the one that's based out of Los Angeles? Um, no, I think it's like, he's California and Hawaii. The one I sent to you, I think you had a conversation with him, Gordon Gates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he seems pretty solid. He seems busy though. He might be, I don't know. Like, yeah, he might be busy. So, I mean, I'm not gonna talk to him till probably like a, a month or two later. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does he, did, did he file your personal? He, he filed mine last year, yeah. Gotcha. Does he do real estate professional status? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's, he's pretty like, he's, he's, I mean, we kind of had some strategy sessions about how to like um, figure some things out and stuff. But I mean, for me, I, I don't qualify for the reps yet. So it would have to be like, I'd have to quit my W2 first. So like, it doesn't really apply to me yet, but there's definitely something that he, he will do and he'll, he'll, we're going to work on in the future. Yeah, so you're in uh, Hawaii, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just sent a message to my guy. Um, he's done my taxes in Washington and California. I'm just making sure he does Hawaii as well. But if so, he, he's really good. He plays around a lot with the numbers. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Can you it in the chat? No, I, I didn't put his contact. I'm, I'm waiting to see if he, he does Hawaii. I know he does the West Coast for sure, but I don't, I don't know if he goes out your way yet. Thanks, Matt. appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. Awesome. Do you guys, um, I don't know if this, if you got, if this is a conversation you guys want to talk about, but um, all the proposed changes in um, 1031, capital gains, any opinions on that? From somebody that's been following, because I, I, I've i stopped following. So I, I, I got to get caught up <laughs> on everything. You know, a good guy to listen to is Ken McElroy boils it down pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does a pretty good job because it's really hard to follow it up, but follow all that and then try to interpret it from a real estate lens. And he does almost every couple of days, he does an interview with somebody and it's pretty solid in case anybody's interested. Do you guys, um, yeah, Ken McElroy is awesome. Like that's, that's why I love YouTube. Like I, you can get the, you can get information like straight from, you know, the experts uh, not reporting through, you know, the biased media, mainstream media. So, um, but did you get that through his podcast? Like he has like a, not a podcast, but it's like a, sh like a little segment on his channel. Yeah. He has a channel called Ken McElroy and uh, that's where his information seems pretty spot on. Of course, you got to always listen and try to interpret it yourself too, because that's just one person's opinion. Um, but you know, he's, he's obviously built a good portfolio has been in the industry probably more than more years than we've been alive kind of a thing. So, uh, you know, I, I, I trust a lot of what he says. I don't trust everybody out there. Uh, it's fun to listen to other people though, especially people who are super opinionated, but they don't necessarily have good facts, but Ken seems to be pretty spot on. And then from time to time, um, rich dad, poor dad, that guy, he's, uh, he's got some cool stuff to say too, but he's, uh, he's pretty funny. He's doom and gloom, yeah, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, he's pretty. He's pretty raw, kind of. But yeah. you know, he should be. He's what is he? Eighty years old. So his his investment play is a little different from probably a lot of us. So, right. um, but it's still good. It's good to have good perspective. Yeah, but he, I, yeah, Robert Kiyosaki, like his, he's a little, uh, a little too much on the doom and gloom. Um, I don't agree with everything, but. I agree with most of what he says. And uh, Ken Macro, I believe, is one of his advisors, I think. So um, they wrote books together and stuff. So, I mean, definitely both of them are definitely people we should be listening to and, and considering, right, in the conversation. So, um, but yeah, I got I to gotta start watching Ken Macro's stuff again. Um, 
I don't know if I mentioned this a couple of times, but my favorite podcast now is the all in podcast on YouTube. And it's with uh, David Freeberg, David Sachs, Jason Calacanis and uh, Chamath, Polly Halpatia. They're, they're these are tech tech guys. They're, they're some of them are virt- venture capitalists. They run their own funds. And uh, it's just interesting to to see a bunch of friends that it's lighthearted, you know, they tease each other, they have fun, but they also talk about very serious issues that are going on right now. And um, they're big influencers. So they get news ahead of time, you know, they have strong opinions and a lot of it's pretty logical to me. So just as a FYI, if you guys are looking for something to watch or, you know, get into, like, I love their podcast. I don't know if anybody else watches their podcast or, but um, uh, that's my favorite one now. So, uh, they were talking about inflation as well in that um, they're talking about inflation of vaccines and the ratios that they're being dispersed. Um, and it's good because sometimes they have opposing views and they're not afraid to like go in after each other, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of fun to watch. But um, when it comes to the taxes, so nobody uh, is any, nobody's following that more than more than me, obviously. <laughs> hey, Corey. Roger. Bro, hey, what's up, guys? Aloha. 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 Hey, check it out. We do um, TARDIS, and they okay. introduced us to the most phenomenal tax guys. And they're helping all the TARDIS clients who have properties all across the United States. So they do every state. Um, the guy, Ron Fossum, he's got like 14 people in his office, all team members. They'll do everything from fight with the IRS for you to tax planning to filing your taxes. And they're like so nice. Um, If you want, I can put his info in the thing. And I was actually going to introduce him to Brandon Turner to have him possibly go on bigger pockets because he's so good at like, this is how you should structure your entity. And, you know, just the guy's phenomenal like you'll and he's just cool like i just love working with nice people so if i'll put his info in the chat and if anybody else can use him we're gonna be we switched everything to him and we're filing for the first time this year but he helped us do like a lot of back-end stuff like with all the llcs and all that other stuff to kind of build a good foundation for what it's worth awesome man yeah that'll be great thanks roger thank you yeah yeah aloha aloha I love Roderick. <laughs> I love you, dude. I get so much energy just from like hearing you. <laughs> yeah. He's on the road. He's buying another house. Yeah. Well, yeah, that'll be great if you could share that. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, man. No, I guess we got to get someone on to talk about potential changes and capital gains and stuff. I mean, I, I think it was it, only if you're earning like over 500000 a year, I think. Um, I, I'm not sure, but so it's over a million dollars a year. But yeah, it's definitely oh. interesting stuff. We should all we should dedicate a, a a session to it, and then actually bring on some of the experts who are spending some time on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, it's fascinating. Let's do it. I I thought it was that if they were to do the the 1031 exchange for a property worth more than 500,000, the net or something of that nature, either the property's worth more than 500,000 or the net's worth more than 500,000. So if it's below that, it doesn't impact your ability to do the 1031 exchange. It's just above that. I, I'm not following it. I don't know much about it. That's just what I thought. Mm. That would be great. You know, if it's not, you know, it may not affect a few of us. Um, yeah, just gains. The gains over 500,000, but I'm looking at high price point areas that can be pretty easy to achieve, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we have coming up, let's see. Kiko, or actually, maybe we can just put Lance on the spot for next week <laughs> since he's on the call. Did you said that? Did you ask him, Kiko? Put me on the spot for what? <laughs> uh, we got you on. 
we'll schedule you for uh, next week or the week after. What? On the call, on this call. Oh, you always want me to talk about like what I do? Yeah, well, we can go over it later. Like I got so okay. many questions to ask you, that's why, but I kind of want to save it for uh, another week. That way we can give you the floor and like you can talk about all that you got going on in a, this unique strategy. I don't even know if, can you, I don't even know if you can talk about what you're doing, can you? You can, right? As far as um, I know. With the notes? <laughs> yeah, I can talk about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that's very now, interesting. To explain it? I've never heard any, yeah, why don't we just go into that real quick? Like, um, because maybe other people have, are have, are utilizing this strategy and like it's just something I never heard of and then we can see how we can keep keep it rolling. It's, it'll okay, be a so preview the, for a, a more fuller episode of your story because there's so much to unpack with his story. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Well, wow. let's 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 have him just like give the the basic framework because then uh, then we can keep our minds running and then when he comes on we can have questions and stuff and. Um, perhaps if there's somebody that wants to invest with you too, Lance, like, you know, cause I, we will be jumping in right at some point, um, in the yeah. near future. So, yeah. So just, uh, so what I'm, what I'm doing is not new. This is actually old and then everyone forgot it existed because the bank stepped in and started doing this. And so I'm just using the bank's model and doing what they do. So basically I'm going in on buying properties, like wholesale pricing, like 80 cents on a dollar, less repairs and under, and then, um, I do minor, like I, I, I fix major stuff on these homes. Like I don't want a bad roof. I don't want a bad foundation. Toilets have to flush. Lights have to turn on. That's pretty much it. That's like, that's, that's what I'm looking for. If, 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 if all that stuff happens and uh, you know, water stays on the outside of the house and, and other stuff, stay, like good stuff stays on the inside, that, that's it. It's like livable. So that we get them to that state and then um, I go and I buy them at this price. I buy them with a bank. I use commercial lending. So I'm paying, I'm getting a five-year, um, a five-year term, 20-year AM. Um, I'm usually paying right now like 5%, half a point. So I'm getting that set up. And then what I do is I take that property and let's say I buy it for a hundred thousand. Uh, I take that property. I'm in Texas guys. This isn't Hawaii. So just add, you know, times it by five and it's all the same, just bigger numbers at the end. So I buy it for a hundred and then I'll go and find someone to buy it for me for let's say uh, probably around 140 would be like, a, if I'm buying it for a hundred, I probably want to sell it for at least 140. Uh, they they contract with me at one, where I'm going to say 145 for easy numbers. So they buy it for me for 145. They give me $15,000 down and I finance them. So I'll finance them at like nine and a half percent. So I will have a note with them. They'll, we have a note together at 130 because they pay me 145 for the home, less of 15 downs, 130. I've got a note with the bank for 100. I'm paying the bank 5% on a 20. They're paying me 9.5% on a 30. And so I get my 15 up front. And then each month I cash flow like 500. And then when they refinance or sell the property or default or whatever, um, happens when that when that comes to an end. Usually, what I owe and what they owe, there's like a starting out. There's a thirty thousand dollar gap, but that gap widens every single month because I'm paying significantly more towards principal than they are because I have a lower interest rate and a shorter term. So after a few years, it can be a it can go from a thirty to a forty, maybe to a fifty thousand dollar gap. They refinance, and that's great. I get my. 50,000 at the end while well, I cash flowed 500 a month and made 15 up front. So I've been doing that for like the last year. I've done like 40 of those and they're good. I mean, it's like 20,000 a month of income now every month. And um, has any of them like defaulted to you? Not even close. Most of them are paying extra payments. Okay. Let's talk about that because I think this is something to, it kind of confirms something to me because these client, these buyers coming to you, Typically, they can't get traditional financing. That's why they want to pay the higher percentage. Uh, maybe their income isn't high enough, but you see that they're, you see that they they have income, and then that they're going to be living in, um, you know, houses with family, right, to help support. And yeah. so, what makes you choose? What makes you decide? Okay. I will give you this seller finance. You can buy my house seller finance and give them a note. 
Uh, first of all, they have fifteen thousand dollars in the game. They got some serious skin in the game, and they don't they don't want to lose that money. So, a lot of them, their mentality is like, this is their life savings going into this home. They're not losing it, and so that's uh, that's the biggest thing. Like, I don't budge on the down payment. Like, it's ten percent minimum down payment. And if they got some weird crap going on, or like, I know that they're a drug dealer or a hooker or something weird like that, that 10 turns into like 12 or 13. Like I want some extra skin in the game because they might end up in jail, in which case I will end up with the home again, but I don't, it's not bad for me financially to end up with the home because that home was, especially with how price that Dallas is very consistent. We've been consistent, like six, 8% a year appreciation forever. Like even in 08, we, we saw like flatlined basically. It didn't go down here really because the jobs jobs market is so strong here. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not terribly concerned. Like the rest of the country can have its problems, but I don't know. I sound like a freaking Texan and I don't want to sound like a Texan, but the economy here is, <laughs> is pretty strong, man. Like there's a lot of companies, a lot of big businesses coming here. There's a lot of jobs like yeah. everyone I know is looking for more people to work for them right now. And there's like a labor shortage here. So I'm not super worried about home values going down here. There's just incredible demand. And so like, as long as the home values go up, if they default at some point, well, I owe the bank started at hundred, maybe that turned into like 95 and the home I sold for 145, I can probably sell for like 175 now. So it's only good for me here in Texas, it takes about 60 days for a foreclosure and three weeks for an eviction. So once I foreclose oh, and get the property back in my name, I can have them out in under 90 days. And then I'm selling the home again. And yeah, I lost three months of, you know, 500 bucks a month. Plus I had to cover the mortgage. But when I sell it again, guess what I get? Another down payment. So right. whatever, I don't care. Like I'm going to weigh more than make up for all the costs that I sunk in to to cover the holding during that period of time and the attorney's fees and everything else because I'm getting it all back on the down payment and way more. And right. I have a note that's worth way more after that too. Like it's it's only good for me financially to foreclose. It's not good for the banks because they can't disposition property. They can't repair property. Like, yeah, yeah I don't but You can. It's what you I do. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have everything in place. Like it's not a problem. You know, the only thing that could be a problem is everybody defaulted at once. Right. In which yeah. case, I got Uncle Joe. He will bail me out, man. Joe <laughs> Biden will bail me out. I believe it. I really think the government will bail us out because if all of my loans default, everyone's defaulting. And if everyone's right, defaulting, yeah, they're going to bail us out. It's going to be just like COVID moratorium on foreclosures or whatever, and I'll be safe. So if it gets to that point, I I, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm not ready to be as... Uh, uh, like, I, like I, I'm not ready to be where you're at yet, but uh, I, I see the logic there. And like, if everybody, yeah, if you had the foreclosure, that's good. That's going to be the government stepping in at some point. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, I Someone's so. going to do something like COVID was the closest thing that we've seen in a long time to yeah. a situation where everyone could default at once. And the first thing they did is no foreclosures, no evictions. That was one. They of the just first extended orders. that, by the way. The oh yeah. Orders. Yep, they oh, did. Yeah. What's the extension to Corey? I can't remember what they're saying on on the call. I, I have to look it up, but um, yeah. So at, at what point are we? Uh, I guess maybe until we have the herd immunity or something, when they will they start to lift these moratoriums? But he did say that he was surprised that he wasn't surprised that they extended, but he was surprised at the energy in the room because amongst, uh, cause he's a, he's a mayor of, uh, of Marlboro, New Jersey. And so he's in, he's all up in the politics. He, he kind of basically grew up in it. Um, so John is in on all those, uh, discussions. And he said, what surprised him was the, the energy and the tone in the discussion whether or not to extend, meaning that there were conflicting views on whether or not they should extend the moratoriums or lift it. You know, like, is it time to get back to normal? Let's start to lift these things. I th And so obviously they, they voted to extend. Um, but I, I see the uncertainty, like who, nobody really wants to push that button. Cause once you push that button, it's kind of left up to the banks now. It's like, all right, 
like foreclosures everywhere for everybody. Let's flood the market. We need inventory. And then what happens? You know, then we have the opposite. Then it becomes a strong buyer's market. And um, hopefully from what we're hearing is that the banks are working together, you know, with, with the government and the Federal Reserve to, to try to slow roll this out. But you don't know what's, you know, these, some of them are private banks and like, you know, when they lift the moratoriums, unless they put, they lift the moratoriums with stipulations in place. Um, if they just lift it without thinking it through, then even though the banks, you know, they learned their lesson, maybe they want to be the first to market and foreclose on all their inventory and get it out so that they can be the first ones to get their, you know, liquidate those properties and get their money back. Um, and then if so, you know, if it might be a race, just like the vaccine, you know, the, far, the big pharma, they're all racing to get the vaccines out. Like who knows if every, all these banks, you know, they, they plan on slow rolling it because that's, what's good for everybody. But when it, you're, you're held to the fire and it's, it's your bank versus, you know, the other bank, who's to say like, when you lift the moratoriums that everyone's not going to just race to, you know, flood the market with, you know, supply. I don't know, but I'm sure they're going to put things in place like guardrails in place to try not to do that. But that's what happened in 2008, 2009. So I don't know if anybody has an opinion on that, but um, thanks uh, Lance for sharing that. We'll dive in deeper on that, but I just thought it was interesting because even though you, it's not your intent to foreclose, right? If somebody defaults, it's no problem to you. Cause you just, especially in Texas where it, it takes two months to get somebody out in Hawaii, it takes years as you know, cause you know the Hawaii market too, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Here it's very friendly. So it's, it's not a big deal to get someone out, but I honestly haven't had anyone even come close to defaulting. Most okay. And why is that again? Like, let's talk about that. Cause that was interesting. Why do you think people pay are willing to just keep paying and they don't want to default right now especially uh well um first of all i've i did my i've done about 40 or uh, somewhere in 30 between 30 and 40 now and they're all they all i've done them all since COVID started so none of them really have like they all had to prove income um so when i'm selling i have to sell in texas the law is once you do more than five seller finance a year you have to go through an rmlo and so the rmlo they check proof of income they check their credit they check everything and they're doing that. I honestly don't care what anything looks like because they have the 15K down or the, they have the 10% down. And um, I know that a lot of them are making money under the table. Like a lot of the, like most of our clients are Hispanic and they're illegal. And that's okay because they've got, um, they have generally multiple income earners in the home, which is good because uh, if one person gets sick or is unable to, to make the payment, there's other people earning income that can make the payment for them because they don't want to lose that home. Like they put everything they had into it. So they're, they're really trying to keep it. Um, and then uh, uh, the attorney that I work with that I, that I, I started doing this and I kind of you know, cut some corners and did these things totally correct. And there's an attorney I, I met who I, who's done thousands of these seller finance notes in North Texas. And uh, he's done a couple thousand now and his default point rate is under 1% for all the deals he's done. And um, it's, it's basically like, if they're putting that money down, that's the biggest indicator. If they can't get the down payment or they, they can't quite get there, that's the indication that don't do the loan with them. And as long as they've got that down payment, um, you know, and I'm also not selling expensive homes, like even in Texas, a hundred thousand dollar home is not super expensive. Right. And so, you know, their mortgage payments, 13, 14, 1500 bucks PITI. And so it's, it's pretty doable. And these are for like three bedroom, two bathroom, three bedroom, two bathroom homes. These are not like, you know, one ones or anything like that. So uh, they usually have multiple income earners and that, that helps. And then they also have a family. It's kind of like Hawaii. Like if, if you couldn't pay your mortgage, you probably have some family that might help for a few months while you get back on your feet. If you, you know, get sick or get injured or, or something like that happens. But then to take it even a step further, part of the Hispanic culture is like when they can't pay, you don't foreclose. They just hand you the keys and say, here you go. Like, I'm out. Because mm. they don't want legal trouble in these states. They just, they just want out. So right. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of good things for everybody around this strategy because they really want to own homes. They want to improve them. Um, and, you know, we're happy to sell them. 
And so it just, it works for everybody really, really well. Yeah. Well, that, that, that reminds me a lot of, uh, because we're, we're forming of another fund that's more going to, it's going to act like as a gap fund. So we're going to be, you know, in, in Hawaii, uh, for deals in Hawaii and, and possibly Washington state, since we, you know, we have infrastructure set up there that when we're talking to our attorney about like, how do we put the guard, you know, are the right guardrails in place? How do we structure this fund? Um, the first question he, or the first thing he says is like, you know, it's a, it's really risky, right. To be in second position or to have an equity position. I was like, yeah, we know all that. Um, but it's kind of like you, it's like in the position that we're in, it's not as risky for us because we have the team, the crews to step in, in, in the worst case scenario, we know the market intimately. So it, it just because a strategy is risky or, you know, uh, unconventional and, and a lot riskier, it doesn't mean it's, it, it might be risky to that person or someone else, but perhaps not you, right? So like the big banks, um, yeah, they don't, they're not good at um, taking back inventory, right? Because that's not the business that they're in. They're in the business to make money off of money and they just lend money. And uh, so, but for you, it's less risky because you have the infrastructure in place. You have the teams, the crews, the know-how. So to execute in the worst case scenario, right? So it's kind of like similar, I feel, to um, to the position that, that we're in when we're looking at starting this gap fund. So I understand that. That's a, that could be, and I think that's something that could be seen across different strategies in the industry. Like maybe you you have a law degree background and um, you know, so maybe chasing foreclosure properties like aren't as risky for you, you know, cause you, you know how to navigate that. Whereas some you know, people like us, we're going to have to hire attorneys. We're going to have to budget in the cost for that. So um, for us, it's not feasible, but you know, everybody has unique skills. I think that they can lean on where certain strategies may be less risky than, than others. And if, if that's the case, there may be a lot of opportunity there. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. So we'll dive in yeah. deeper maybe uh, next time on not yeah. just that, but all, diff all the different strategies that you use because uh, you guys take down a lot of deals. <laughs> I was pretty shocked when I heard the new number. So he's doing uh, a lot of good stuff. We have a lot to learn from him. So it'll be pretty exciting. This room. Yeah, it goes both ways. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, if you have any questions about it, like you want me to talk about this more next week, you said? Oh, uh, it could be next week. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk off offline and uh, we'll catch up. Sounds good. Yeah. Or we're going to crash your uh, date night with your wife tonight. We're going to go to Tech and Smacks, man. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Thanks for All joining. right. Man, that blew by fast. It's already uh, 11.15 in Hawaii. So, um, I guess we can uh, call a meeting and then uh, next week we might have uh, Lance on hopefully. <laughs> and and uh, I guess if for this week, guys, um, keep a lookout maybe uh, in the Facebook group and stuff because we might be posting some opportunities coming and I already have people messaging us for the deals that we have out in Hawaii. And then, um, you know, perhaps we can start. We're, we're always going to look here first, you know, where our, our friends and colleagues that come on our calls and see um, who's need, you know, wanting to get into a deal and we can, we can help you with that. So thanks everybody for jumping on this Friday. Enjoy the weekend and uh, we'll see you next week. See you next week. See ya. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks everyone. See ya. Oh, uh, Daniel, Daniel, Lee, Daniel, are you still on? Can someone cut the record? Oh, is that me? Oh, there's Daniel. Daniel, calm. Oh. Yes, sir. What's up? Hey, try to send us that information on what you need partnership on in Indeed. Okay. Okay. Try, uh, just email them. Yeah, I, I got it. I mean, I'm not super organized yet. I, I've got some deals. So, like, I just got to, I'm going to put together a little, uh, yeah, put something together.